everybody. I am Nikki Sakosha from Gather New Haven. I direct a camp that serves over 400 kids throughout New Haven and beyond to teach them both sailing um, and coastal studies at Long Wharf Nature Preserve, and it's run out of the Sound School in New Haven. Um, we offer uh, over 50% scholarship to allow easy access to those types of um, programs. And um, through my preserve manager job, uh, we have 80 acres of land throughout New Haven. Uh, we were one of the first urban land trusts in Connecticut. Through those preserves, it allows access to both green space and blue space um, in an urban setting. Um, to allow people to enjoy that and also for for nature to enjoy that. Uh, in growing up, I always knew I wanted to be some kind of teacher. Um, my, my dad was a fifth grade science teacher in New London, Connecticut. Um, so I had that um, figure in my life. Um, to inspire me, I've always loved informal education. Gr growing up, it really gave me uh, a chance to explore what I was really interested in um, and really seek out opportunities um, in environmental education. Uh, for example, in seventh grade, I sought out Project Oceanology Camp for Girls, uh, and that really got me involved in learning more about like field research. And then in high school, I did a uh, environmental research camp with the state called Project Search with Alberto Mimo, um, which was very inspiring and showed me how important it is to provide opportunities. Uh, those opportunities that really allow you to expand on what you may wanna do as a career. And, and not just like having people visit and say, this is what I do. Like, no, you're actually doing something that like field biologists do every day. To get that practice early on is amazing. And the reason why I, I, I bring this up as an inspiration of why I wanted to get into environmental education is to help facilitate and provide those types of opportunities that, that I, I had growing up because I know how much of a profound effect it had on me. And it was very empowering because it's what, what I wanted to do. It wasn't necessarily something that was going on in school. I actually, like, I personally struggled in school. Like I was, like, I had to try really hard at, at math, which is very applicable to science. Um, and m making those connections. So have, having the opportunity, those, those informal education opportunities hel helped me make those uh, connections and helped me really value experience more than more than just knowing all these all um all these theories and stuff is it was applying so how i see environmental education programs is creating a connection or educating about how we're all connected uh on this planet and applying the, the science that's there in introducing kids and adults to the environment. It's important to be very conscious of their, their, their development, like where they're at in their development and how their understanding of the world is. And because Environmental education, what I love about it is it's so multifaceted and that there's so many approaches you can take to it. Like you can take an art-based approach to it, which I, I particularly love as an artist. Um, there's all these different ways to, to connect people to the outdoors, to nature, to the environment, that it doesn't have to be a, a direct like 
throwing all these all these facts and theories at them like no like it's the whole point of it is you're getting the hands-on experience you're seeing these things in person and out in the field i'm showing them like a, a turtle they're going to be fascinated by it because it's an animated thing that's happening right there but what happens if you don't find a turtle on the trail like how do you make that experience valuable to them uh and there's different creative ways to go about that and one particular approach i really have loved taking is uh teaching both kids and adults track and sign animal track and sign because it allows both both kids and adults to slow down and critically think about uh, a situation that's in front of you and how it happened and what could have left it out whenever we would bring up uh, symbiotic relationships and how it, that's a big word <laughs> like uh, so you always have to like group that big word with something that is going to create a light bulb in in people's heads in kids heads especially um so this for me like helps me being a creative person um is i really want these connections to get that i, I really want that light bulb to go off in in the kids head so they they visually remember it in in their head and I always try to hone in on my inner child. Uh, what what would help me remember this? And um, that it always kind of has to be a little bit silly or something that I've seen before. So back to the symbiotic relationship, I bring that back to Finding Nemo. Like who hasn't seen Finding Nemo or Finding Dory? Like, especially for the, the newer generation. And I always talk about the clownfish and the sea anemone especially uh, because they have such a hard time saying sea anemone <laughs> and, and they laugh. Um, so they have a bit of humor to connect it to. And so then talking about how both of these organisms benefit from each other, how they do. Um, and symbiotic relationships are one of my favorite things to teach about to both kids and adults, because it just shows that that connectiveness in nature, um, how we can benefit more from each other than rather th together rather than apart, and how many thousands of millions of years it it's taken nature to develop those relationships and how we really need to think about that too. So that's just a long way of talking about how making those connections with kids, making them humorous, making them connective um, is really important because because then it makes it more approachable if, if they're attaching those humorous images um, with, with a really cool uh, scientific fact. Being able to incorporate both is a dream to me. Um, and yeah, they equally benefit from each other. I implemented a few years ago um, a homeschool uh, nature art program where I, we would go outside and just create with the environment, kind of taking a uh, Andy Gold, Goldsworthy approach. If anybody's familiar with that artist that, that is able to uh, take natural elements, make these cool structures. And the point of it is like, yes, you're being creative, but you're, you are just then leaving these sculptures that are still part of the environment. They're not harming the environment. They can just decompose back. Um, but it also just creates that, that element, a creative element of the, of the human being. Um, that's appreciative of art and the fact that it's art that doesn't take from the environment is really important. And also what is, is such a profound impact for me to teach kids 
creatively, how to be creative, is that you don't need all these expensive art supplies to be an artist or to be creative. It's about like using what's in front of you. It's <laughs> teaching resourcefulness. Whenever I'd have an, an animal out and be like, uh, ki kids would, and sometimes adults be like, oh, is it gonna bite me? Um, like anything with, with teeth, like it is there to, to bite me. Um, so what I always try to do, especially when it comes to, I'll call them volatile defenses of plants and animals, I try to be super clear of trying to convey that th these are the only some of the only ways that these organisms can communicate with us and defend their well-being so we need to be conscious of of them around us and respect their their defenses and how they've developed them and then get into the science of how they adapted to be to be this way. I think about even like thorns, thorns on plants. Like kids are always running through them, they're getting scratched and stuff. Um, and they're like, why don't you just rip them all out? And why do, why does the plant need thorns? I always try to give them the reason why they need those thorns. It's a chance to really talk really in depth about uh, the defense adaptations of both plants and animals. What I've learned throughout my career in education is to always seek out opportunity. Don't expect it to just come to you. If you're interested in in nature and in teaching environmental education, first get experience at it. Like go out into the field or find somebody um, that works out in the field and volunteer with them. If you're, I mean, in middle school or high school, join your environmental club, um, and just get involved in what's what's relevant right now, especially, um, and seek out those volunteer opportunities. Like I would, my my mom and I would always, uh, when I was growing up, take advantage of the volunteer opportunities with the DEP, DEP, uh, tagging geese and. Um, where we, we would do stuff with fisheries, uh, tagging butterflies and stuff. There's all those opportunities that are out there. You just have to seek them. Even if you just Google them, like Google those opportunities. That's exactly how I found the environmental research camp that uh, the state used to put on. And that was that involved a few Yukon professors that we were actually doing research for uh, in different state parks, like mapping invasive species, um, and catching dragonflies and damselflies for David Wagner at uh, UConn. Like that's fun field science and, that, and people need to know that that's fun. Uh, that science can be fun, that there's all the nitty gritty in between, but it's about the, the relevancy. And also what's so important about environmental education is the communication, the communication of this science to make it relevant. Because you can have all these scientists all around the world collaborating, making great strides, but it takes the public understanding what's happening and conveying that to the world. And environmental education takes that step by step through childhood development up until adults to create those important connections. <laughs>